Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. Hi, I'm Matthew from Colorado. And I know how to tell if someone's in a cult and the Stephen Hassan stuff, you know, that. But how do you tell if someone's brainwashed? Because just because someone is brainwashed doesn't necessarily mean they're in a cult. So if you have any tips, uh, that would be appreciative. Thank you. This person actually used to call in a lot. Their audio quality was really hard to understand, is really hard to hear. I'm glad that it's improved because they always come with interesting questions. I appreciate you calling in with that one, with improved audio, too, on top of that. In the psychology community, there is some level of disagreement about whether or not brainwashing exists. It definitely doesn't exist the way most people conceptualize brainwashing to be, the way they perceive it the way that they think it exists, it's not like that. But in my opinion, brainwashing does exist. And I want to show you guys an example of this. I've showed an example of this in my main channel's videos before. But for anybody who doesn't think brainwashing exists, let me show you what I'm talking about when I'm referencing brainwashing. My name is Harold Webb from West Palm Beach, Florida. My name is Aaron Wilson from Urania, Louisiana. This is a very happy moment for me, for now I am free, free from McCarthyism. Friends, the only way to stop fascism in America is to do as I have done, stand up and fight for our rights. My name is Louis Griggs and my home is at Jacksonville, Texas. I stayed behind to escape the red bait of McCarthy and are sure that I'll never again have to fight in another unjust war as I did in Korea. Even if I had won in repatriation, the fate of Dickinson and Bachelor would have stopped me. My name is Richard Tennyson. I live in Alden, Minnesota. People who hate war and stand up for their beliefs are faced with McCarthy and his fascist stop control House and Americans Activities Committee. I will return someday when I can speak for peace lawfully. I have kind of a complicated hierarchy of what a cult is. I did this video a while back. It's about the different levels of cults because a lot of people felt like comparing Jonestown to Jehovah's Witnesses, to, you know, any other group out there, is unfair. How do you compare Patriot Front to Jonestown? They're not exactly the same, right? So I created this hierarchy of levels of cults. There's level one, two, and three, or tiers of cults. Basically, the difference revolves around whether or not they're centralized or decentralized, and if they have a hierarchy, a strict hierarchy. So level one is decentralized and non-focused, like they're not focused on a central figure that kind of calls the shots and controls things. Level two is decentralized, but focused. They're focused on a single figure that calls the shots and creates the belief system and the doctrine. And then there's level three, which is centralized and hierarchical. And that's where you get like Jehovah's Witnesses and stuff like that. That's how I define cults. I mean, it varies from group to group heavily. But the thing that all high control groups like cults have in common are the way that they control people. Behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. That's how mind control is achieved with different control methods. So if somebody isn't in a cult, but they're brainwashed by an ideology, then I would argue that the ideology that brainwashed them is some form of cult. That would be my position. And hopefully that gave a little bit of, hopefully that shed light on my viewpoint on this. Uh, Hello, and this is Aaron. I'm from Michigan. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Um, my question to you is somebody who is also raised in a, uh, I guess, a, a fundamentalist uh, uh, religion is, you know, now as an adult and now that you've passed that, what are some things that you would say are a positive takeaway from that? Um, you know, and nothing's all bad. What are some things you're grateful for in your upbringing in that religion? I was raised in Jehovah's Witnesses. So I never really had an opportunity to be my authentic self outside of the religion. So I don't know who I would have been. I don't know what kind of a moral compass I would have had if I hadn't grown up in the religion, but I feel happy with where my moral compass is now. For example, I'm a pacifist. I believe that 
Human life comes before all else. It is the most precious thing in the universe. And I believe that death should be the absolute last resort in any situation. Being a pacifist as I am, I feel that's something that I picked up from the religion that I grew up in, and I can appreciate that. I feel like I got a decent moral compass from them, although I think they're terribly wrong in some of the moral values that they like to espouse. Horrifically wrong, life-damagingly wrong. So I... I don't want to make it out like they are like the center of moral virtue, Jehovah's Witnesses. They're not. But they do have moral values that I appreciate and that I stand up for, that I like, and that I want to teach to my kids. I just wish that all of that other stupid bullshit didn't have to come along with it. Anyways, I guess that would be my answer to the question. I like the moral values that I got from them, though I may have come to those on my own anyways, so... This is from Lilith. Hi, my name is Lilith. I'm from Michigan. I'm wondering why do Christians believe certain things are a sign from God? When the wildfires and hurricanes were going on, my grandma would not stop saying that the disasters were a sign from God. She claims God is punishing them for being too liberal and that this is what God does if you drift too far away. Why do Christians think people deserve this horrible stuff? Interesting question. I think there's a part of our psyche that wants to see retribution, that wants to see our enemies suffer terribly. And that part of our psyche has been there for so long that it basically formed out in our religious beliefs, too. I mean, you can see in the Bible, all through it, God getting retribution, divine retribution against his enemies. You can see examples of God ordering his people to take out like entire cities for just the slightest mistake or, or the littlest thing that they did, the smallest slight against him. Retribution against our enemies has been a part of our psyche for since the beginning, basically. And we continue to see it shine through. But I maintain that we should do our best to rise above our animal instincts and try to live as a part of a civilized society and recognize that human life is precious in all forms and suffering of any kind is a bad thing by its very nature. This is from The Biggest of Chungai. The title is Failed Patriot Front Infiltration. Hey Owen, I super chatted last stream about my failure to infiltrate Patriot Front. I managed to get as far as their in-person interview in my state before they detected that I wasn't a sincere member. I posed as a law student willing to provide the group with financial and eventually legal aid, which is quite close to my actual background as I plan to go into law school to help reduce the role of religion in my state government. The online interview consisted of mainly questions about my background. I describe myself as ethnic white nationalist seeking to help remove all non-white immigrants and citizens. The questions I was asked mostly consisted about my beliefs, including religious. I describe myself as an atheist, and they didn't seem to mind. And political beliefs, as well as my skills at outdoorsmanship and hiking. I, I was also asked about my ability to help spread propaganda or participate in in-person demonstrations. As far as I know, they officially kick out anyone who thinks violence is necessary, so there's that at least. That is true. That is part of their surface-level belief that, you know, violence is wrong. However, they do have a deeper belief that revolution is okay under the right circumstances. And of course, the definition of revolution is overthrowing the existing government by force if necessary. So on a surface level, they do believe that violence is wrong, you know, according to anybody in the group or whatever, uh, violence is wrong, don't want any violence. But they continue to justify it through their belief system over and over and over again. Even if it's in subtle ways, they do justify violence against the government. Patriot Front specifically has been preparing for a time when society is going to collapse and they are going to seize the reins of control over society 
and rebuild it in their image, which is basically a neo-Nazi image, for lack of a better term. Let's keep reading the email here. As far as I know, they officially kick out anyone who thinks violence is necessary, so there's that at least. I was also asked about how many people I knew were receptive to their beliefs. They have a private chat room for people to wait until interviews, which occur every day at 20 hundred CST, which is at 8 p.m. I initially became aware of the group because I saw some of their flyers at my college. Well, I hope you found this interesting. I could try to provide further details if you'd like, and I hope you'll share my story and knowledge about the recruitment process. That is very interesting. I appreciate you sending that to me. If you have more to send me, then go ahead. You have my email address. Um, if anyone's curious, it's telltalemailbag at gmail.com. Anyway, thank you so much. That is really interesting. Patriot Front is an incredibly disturbing group for many different reasons. One of the reasons I find Patriot Front so disturbing is because they have somehow convinced people that they are a, a fed operation, that it's just feds that work there, that, that are trying to pretend to be extremists. I don't know why anybody would think that, how anyone would reach that conclusion. But Joe Rogan seems to believe that. I talked about that in a video I did about Patriot Front a while back. Blows my fucking mind. The fact that they're slipping under the radar, nobody seems to be worried about them because they have thoroughly convinced people that there's nothing to worry about. It's an extremely concerning group and we should definitely have our eyes on them. I don't know if you guys knew, but YouTube is doing this massive crackdown right now where they're demonetizing and deprioritizing a ton of channels all at once. Um, for example, a true crime YouTuber with 5 million subscribers called JCS, Criminal Psychology, is basically leaving YouTube completely. 5 million subbies and they're leaving YouTube because of what's happening right now. All of the demonetization and deprioritization has led to a massive flood of manual reviews. And it's increased the amount of time that it takes manual reviewers to actually review a video. It started out at like, you know, sometimes same day. Certainly by the next day they'd have it reviewed, but now it's all the way up to like a maximum of seven days. It's like a full week sometimes. I had some reviewed and it took them three days. That's a problem for me because I release my videos in succession the day after I stream. I don't even care about whether or not the video is making money. That's not as important to me as the fact that when it's demonetized, that means YouTube destroys its engagement and reach. It just cripples it. It doesn't go anywhere. On the podcast, my videos usually get around 30 to 50,000 views, depending on the type of video. I've even gotten up to 80 to 100,000 views on some. On my main channel, they get 80,000 to 150,000. Sometimes they've gone up to 300,000, and I have a couple that are past a million views. Well, if it's demonetized, it won't see more than 10,000 views sometimes. 15 or 20,000 absolute maximum if it's demonetized. It's not about the money. It's about the fact that they're just destroying its ability to go out to a wider audience when they do that. So since it takes a week sometimes to get things like manually reviewed, I decided to get a week ahead of schedule and do a podcast early. So that's why I'm doing it on a Monday instead of next week when I normally would. Moving forward, I intend to have a podcast edited and pushed out and ready to release a week ahead of schedule from here on. So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you guys understand why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Captain Gars, I'd wager that YouTube is getting contributions from someone. For example, a lot of the traditional value type channels are doing fairly well lately. Yeah, um, that wouldn't surprise me. Also, YouTube just got lambasted for um, by Washington Post and some other fact-checking organizations. It was just in the news recently. And they, they want to look like they're doing something. So they're basically making things way, way, way more strict. And it's just a complete pain in the ass. I fucking hate YouTube sometimes. I heart dogs. If podcasts are pre-recorded, what about super chats? They aren't pre-recorded. I do the live stream usually. 
and I read the super chats and I talk to all you guys and all that other stuff. And then I get all of the content together and I cut it up into segments and edit it down and cut out all of the ums and uhs and whatever else. And I upload the videos. And if there's a particularly interesting super chat question, I will upload it to TikTok or I'll add it on to voicemails or I'll add it on to the end of one of the segments or something. The question that you have here, I don't know how I would fit it into something like this question doesn't really tack on to any of my segments well. So it, I'm probably not going to include this in the content that I release publicly. It's just us.